here and ate up their snakes. So they had a snake to pick up by the tail. They had a staff again. The rest of them didn't have a staff. And so what he's showing, even in centuries ago, uh, people may give the appearance of doing it, but uh, when it comes to the final showdown, it just doesn't hold up. Mm -hmm. Yes? Why couldn't Paul heal Trophimus? Because God didn't enable him to do it. Oh, but he was able to do that, though, wasn't he? If God wanted him to. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. In other words, we've got the message of God, but we can't use it any way we want to. Okay. You know, we say there's power in prayer. Okay, God, make me a wealthy man. God's going to say, I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you're asking for something you don't want you're asking for. You think I'd be great. No, it'd be the beginning of all your problems. Yeah. And I'm going to spare you that. I'm not going to let you do it. Yeah. Or let you have it. So, uh, you know, this is a problem a lot of people have with prayer. They say, well, how do you know God answers prayer? Well, I know it because he's answered my prayers over and over and over again. Does that mean he's answered all of them? Probably not. I'm not sure. Sometimes I pray for people or for certain situations that I don't have any idea what the, what the current status is. I'm, this morning in my prayers, I prayed for three individuals by name. And I honestly don't know what their status is right now. Come on in. Have a seat. I'm just Hi, doing some Gail. chatting, waiting Always on you to get here. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, sure, sure. Here's where we are. Oh, okay. There you go, Missy Gale. Thank you. All right, let's bow our heads in prayer and we'll get started today. Father in heaven, you've given us a wonderful book to study, and I thank you for those who are here. And I pray that as we read, we'll be hearing you speak to us through these words. Help us to really understand what you're saying. Help us to uh, be willing to ask questions and to make comments to stimulate the thinking of all of us so that we'll delve into the passage until we are firmly convinced we understand what you want us to understand and then to apply to our lives. You're so good to us when we start our study today with a reminder of what you've done for us through your son that we could never have done for ourselves and nobody else could have done for us, but you did. So we just want to express our gratitude and I pray that our gratitude will be expressed by our faithfulness in living for you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, we're starting with verse 24 today in uh, the second chapter. We'll finish up this chapter and we'll start another chapter. Uh, I want to go back and read starting with verse 21, which we talked about last week, because this is where he kind of introduces this subject. And I want us to see verse 24 in light of these preceding verses that lead up to it. He writes in verse 21 of uh, chapter 2 of 1 Peter, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Now the area in which he's talking about here is suffering. Did Jesus suffer for us? Yes. Will we be called upon to suffer for him? Yes, we will. That's what many people have a problem with. They think every time something goes wrong, every time they suffer, that the Lord may be punishing them. And uh, we, I think we've mentioned this last week. You remember in the ninth chapter of John's Gospel, uh, a boy or a man born blind, and the people said, who sinned, uh, this man or his parents? And Jesus said, neither one. Well, those are the only two possibilities. No, it isn't. Well, how do you explain his blindness? So that God can show through him his great power. What did God do? Gave him his blindness back. Gave him his sight. Didn't give him his blindness back. He took away the blindness. <laughs> he took it away. He gave him his sight. And, uh, oh, so that's the purpose. Yeah. Didn't enter their minds. And a lot of times we think we've exhausted all the options for why something is happening when there may be another option. That's why we study God's Word, to find out what uh, all this is about. Well, the point he's making in verse 21 is, you're a follower of him who suffered, you're going to suffer just as he suffered, not to the same degree, not in the same way, but you will suffer uh, because you're a follower of him. This is one of the things that uh, is in God's plan. Uh, there are so many times that uh, our suffering 
really turns out to be a tremendous blessing. But all the time we were going through it, we could not see that at all. But uh, we learned later on. We have a lot of examples of that. Uh, Job stayed after he had gone through humiliating suffering was better than it was before he ever began to suffer this way. And yet, uh, during that time, it had to be a tough experience. All right, verse 22, who committed no sin, in other words, Jesus suffered, and he didn't obviously do anything wrong, uh, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. He never tried to trick us or fool us or make us think something was true that wasn't. And while being reviled, uh, he did not revile again. In other words, by being sneered at and mocked and uh, told terrible things to his face, he did not return in kind to those people. While suffering, he uttered no threats. The classic example is when he's on the cross, he did not retaliate in any way at all, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. That's to his Father in heaven. Now we come to verse 24, which is where we start new material today. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. Some version of the Bible will say on the tree. That's fine. The word tree and cross come from a Greek word that means something made out of wood. So it can refer to a tree. It can refer to anything that uh, you might do with uh, the wood that comes from the tree. So that we might not die to sin. Uh, so uh, some versions say that so that we might part uh, with sin, so that sin is no longer dominating our lives. Uh, I like the word die to sin. That really picks up the same thing that the other words do from the Greek word. And live to righteousness, by, for by his wounds you were healed. Obviously, he's making reference to the 53rd chapter of Isaiah in this passage. Isaiah 53 prophesied uh, hundreds of years earlier what was going to happen to Jesus, that he would die, that he would suffer, that this is a part of God's plan. And it even gave some of the minute details of the kind of suffering that he would endure. Well, the very fact that everything worked out exactly as he prophesied that it would feeds our faith. That's what we call fulfilled prophecy. In other words, it came to pass exactly as uh, the Lord said it would. And so uh, that helps us to realize you can count on what he says because if he says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And it did. So this is evidence for that. All right, number one. What is meant by Jesus bearing our sins in his body on the cross? Uh, this literally refers to the fact that he is paying the penalty Greetings, good to see you all. Uh, he's paying the penalty for our sins. Now, um, there are four words. I know you can't see this, and I'm going to have to go down and buy my own markers because all the markers we have here are very faint, and uh, so I'll try to get that done sometime. But anyhow, I want to introduce you to these four words uh, because you're going to read them uh, somewhere along the line. And I don't want you to get confused because all four of these words are talking about the same thing, only from a different vantage point. Now, the word expiation is the word that uh, is describing what we're talking about in this particular verse. Expiation simply means to satisfy divine justice. Now, let me explain what satisfying divine justice means. When man sinned, what did God say would happen because of our sin? We'll die. That's exactly right. Now, is there? how do you explain the fact that we can be saved from our sins, but we haven't yet died? You're baptized. Oh. Yeah, but do we still sin? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're exactly right. Now, the thing we need to recognize is who is the only man in all history who died, but he didn't sin? Jesus. Jesus. He took our place. He died in our place. Now, what's he doing? 
He's doing what God says has to happen because man has sinned. In other words, this sin has to be punished. Do we have to suffer for our own sins? No. Not ultimately. There may be sins we commit along the way. You know, you may have told a lie when you shouldn't have and it kind of backfired on you and embarrassed you. You may have uh, broken the law and speeding too fast and created an accident that injured other people, maybe killed somebody. Are there pretty bad consequences? Yeah. But not eternal punishment. So in order for that to be taken care of, when God said the soul that sins, it will die. If that statement is true, how can we escape the death of our sins? Now, our physical sin is not the result, I mean our physical death is not the result of sin. Do you believe that? Mm -hmm. Good. Now let me explain for those of you who didn't answer. I want you to believe it. Do babies die? Yes. Do babies sin? No. No, they do not. How do you prove that? Now let me make sure you understand this. There are many who practice infant baptism. As far as I know, my knowledge is greatly limited, but to my knowledge, the only church that really practices infant baptism in a sense is the Greek Orthodox Church. And what I mean by that, the Greeks actually put a baby all the way under water and bring them back up. Wow. Now you notice I qualified how I said baptism. Baptism is not baptism because you go under water and come up out of the water. What is the primary example of that being true? <coughs> Every day the swimming pools are open. Yeah. People are going under the water all the time. Yeah. Are they being baptized? No. Not at all. There has to be a reason behind what we're doing. So, a person cannot be baptized unless they recognize they are a candidate for baptism. Now, how do you recognize that you are a candidate for baptism? What is there that is an essential before you are lowered under the water and brought back up out of the water? Knowing the difference between good and bad. All right. Two things. Well, three things, actually. Uh, if you're not a believer in the Lord, you're going into the water means absolutely nothing. And a little baby cannot qualify as a believer. They don't know what that means. They'll learn, but they don't as an infant. Furthermore, we have to repent of our sins. Now, a baby cannot do that either because they don't know the difference between right and wrong. And one of the definitions of sin in the fourth chapter of James is, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Furthermore, there's the confession of faith. That is an acknowledgement that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. So this is a public confession that a person makes that Im indicates to the person doing the baptizing that they are a candidate for baptism. Now, does everyone who shows up for baptism, are they always a candidate for baptism? Who showed up at the baptism of John that were not candidates for baptism? Yeah. And what John say? He said, you generation of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? What are you here for? And uh, they were there just to kind of see what's going on and to find out what's attracting all the people because John had a fantastic uh, number of people present to hear what he was saying. So baptism is only baptism when there is a genuineness of our faith in God and a genuineness of our turning away from sin to follow Christ and our public an announcement and declaration that we want Jesus to be our Lord and our Savior. Well, Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, if you what? Don't, don't do what I tell you to do. Yeah. So what are you doing? You're doing what he tells you to do. Did he command that everybody be baptized? Yes, he did. 
in the Great Commission, his final commission to his disciples said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and continue to teach them, which we're doing right now. We meet together all the time to teach one another, uh, to observe all the things the Lord has commanded us, and he promises to be with us all together to the end of the world. So, all this is to point out the significance of our baptism into Christ. So what we're doing, we're experiencing an obedience to the gospel. The gospel is the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So what is more fitting than the way that God has prescribed for us to do this, and that is to demonstrate before those who are witnesses to our baptism what Jesus did for us. He died, was buried, and rose again. And so we die, are buried, and rise again. Now, in doing that, which portrays a death, a burial, and a resurrection, you don't bury live people, or nearly at least. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, this is a portrayal of what Christ has done for us. And in and of itself, baptism is a powerful sermon. And why anyone would want to avoid it when they come to a proper understanding of what its meaning is, I, I do not understand. Well, at this time, when we are baptized then, divine justice is satisfied for us. Are we going to die physically? Yes. Why? Because it's appointed unto everybody who wants to die, and after that the judgment. That's Hebrews 9.27. Judgment is a time in which we're going to be rewarded as righteous. Those are going to be punished who are evil. But it's a time that no one will escape. For us who are believers and obedient believers in Christ, it'll be a day of rejoicing. For those who rejected Christ, disobeyed the gospel, it'll be a day of beginning of eternity apart from God. Well, <coughs> what Christ has done for us then satisfies divine justice. In other words, did Christ have to break his own law to make it possible for us who are sinners to avoid being separated eternally from God. No, he didn't. Mm. He satisfied that, but the only way he could satisfy that, mm. none of us could die for one another because we're all sinners. Now, how did the Lord prepare us for what Jesus did, which none of the rest of us could do? In the sacrificial system in the Old Testament, they had to offer an animal sacrifice and the sacrifice to be acceptable before God when it was a lamb had to be without what? Blemish. That's right. Without spot or blemish. Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's the way John introduced him. So John was introduced Christ to the world at his day and said, here is the perfect Lamb of God. Now that announcement if they had really understood the sacrificial system in the Old Testament, should have alerted them to what to anticipate as Christ continues on his public ministry. When Jesus made his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem, uh, that week that before the week ended, he was going to be killed on the cross, that city was literally filled with lambs. The lambs, many of them were uh, what do you say, bred, raised, reared? Mm -hmm. What's the word I want to say? Bred. All right. In the area just south of uh, Jerusalem, in and around Bethlehem, and they had sheep everywhere. And they had these sheep ready for those who did not bring them and many people did not bring them because they came from a great distance or because they knew they were going to get them when they came there. But they came to Jerusalem to observe the Feast of Passover. And the Feast of Passover reminds them of the first deliverance that God's people, as God's people, experienced during the time of Moses. 
when nine of the ten plagues did not get the job done to persuade Pharaoh to let his people go, the tenth plague was what? The death of the son. Death. How did God's people escape death in their homes? Blood over the door. Put the blood on the doorpost. What had to be true of that blood? It had to be a lamb's blood. Lamb or goat without blemish. spot or blemish. So that lamb was placed, the blood of the lamb was placed there. And that night when death visited every home in Egypt, death literally passed over the homes where the blood was on the doorpost. Now stop and think about that. How many people in the secular world are going to say, well, oh boy, that doesn't make any sense at all. You killed an innocent animal and you dirtied up the doorpost with blood. Who's going to wash all that off? And how does death pass over? Well, it reminds me of Isaiah 55, verses 7, 8, and 9, where God says, my ways are not yours. My thoughts are not your thoughts. God has his own way of doing things. Well, they were then delivered from Egyptian bondage. And being delivered from Egyptian bondage, what is significant about the first major event that indicated, now we are free? It's the crossing of the Red Sea. Oh, yeah. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the first few verses, talks about the Red Sea experience being comparable to our baptism. That's when we really are free. When we actually identify with Christ in obeying the gospel through his death, burial, and resurrection, rising to walk in newness of life. Well, it's all possible because God did something for us as the perfect Lamb of God that we cannot do for ourselves. Now, there are two other words that... Uh, are used. One is the word propitiation. I I understand that the T-I-A has kind of an S-H sound. Mm -hmm. I hear people pronounce it differently. I'm not saying I'm right. That's just what I understand it to be. Propitiation and atonement. They're pretty much saying the same thing. Now the reason I'm wanting you to see all this is because I know some of you are involved in other studies and I am too when I come to hear Mark teach on Monday nights and the word that has been used in our recent study is the word redeem or the word redemption. Well, this word, when you read atonement, you're actually saying basically what propitiation says or vice versa. And technically, that means, what did he do? He removed the barrier of sin. Now, do you see the distinction? Did he satisfy divine justice? Yes, he did. In other words, God said the soul that sinned shall die, and he died. How could he without sin? Because 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us. So he took upon himself the sins of the world. And by the way, what did he say on the cross that helps us to understand what a real burden that was? Why have you forsaken me? That's exactly right. There's a man that comes to our Wednesday night study up in the Daytona area that a couple weeks ago, before class began, he said, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. We were talking privately. He said, explain to me, how could God forsake his own son? I said, oh, you're talking about what he said at Calvary. He said, yeah, I am. I said, well, that just gives you a picture of the terrible agony and suffering of one who knew no sin and yet had to take upon himself the sin of the whole world. God is so angered and so separated and so rebellious and opposed to all sin that when Jesus in that moment took upon himself the sin of the world, he did it as his son. A concept that sometimes we have difficulty processing in our minds. But uh, to me, it's not a case of where God, you know, turned against his son, said, never got anything to do with you again. No, it's in that moment when divine justice was being satisfied. 
and he became our sin to take away the barrier of sin. So here's God and here's man, and in this area here, there's a lot of sin. He's got to get rid of that barrier. If you get rid of the sin barrier, then God and man can come together. And that's exactly what happened in the person of Christ. Now, another word that's used is the word redemption. And I can't even spell it. Should be another P in there. Redemption. Redeemed is the theme of some of our hymns. Redeemed how long long to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. It means to pay the price for us to be brought back into a right relationship with God. So a price had to be paid. The price in the Old Testament system was a sacrifice, an animal sacrifice. Christ became our sacrifice to be the price paid so we'd be brought back into a right relationship with God. Well, if he satisfied divine justice and removed the barrier, obviously that pays the way for us to come into right relationship with God. So there's one more word to mention here. That's the word reconciliation. Now, when we are sinners and our sins have not been forgiven, we are estranged from God because of the barrier of sin. God says, uh, I can't answer your prayer. You're on the wrong side. You're a follower of Satan. You're not really a believer in me. If you were a believer in me, you'd do what I tell you to do. So that barrier needs to be removed. In reconciliation, when that barrier is removed, what does he do? He brings the estranged back into friendship relationship with God. Now here are two people, and they're not speaking to each other for whatever reason. And either one's going to break the ice to try to mend things. But if something happens, that these two that... Uh, don't like each other, don't want to be together with each other. Uh, if something happens or someone makes something happen that brings them together, what have they done? They reconciled them. So we who were at enmity with God are now in a friendship relationship with God, in a love relationship with God. Does this all make sense to you? Yes, sir. Th these are, I call this shop talk. When I talk to somebody who works out of the space, I understand a little bit of what they're saying. A lot of it I don't understand. Why? They're talking a language that I didn't grow up to understand. I've not trained myself to understand it. They are technologists in their own right, very intelligent people. They have language that uh, conveys the thoughts very accurately, but not to me, because they didn't know the meaning of that word. Now, the reason I'm going into detail is because I wonder how many people who visit our churches will come and hear these words, and it just goes on by them. I mean, what are you talking about? Don't have any idea. But if we can have this mentioned to us several times, then I think it'll finally take root and we'll realize, now, you may not technically understand the way in which I've expressed it, and other people can express it probably better than I have. I'm sure they can. But anyhow, basically, God did not break his own law. In fact, he kept his law with regard to his attitude towards sin. He hates sin so much that he let his own son become sin so that man would not be a total failure. Now, folks, if that isn't grace, I don't understand what grace is. Grace is doing something for us that we do not deserve. And yet he does it anyhow. All right. Let me get back to these questions then. Uh, what is meant by Jesus bearing our sins in his body on the cross? In this particular case, it means he paid our penalty. He died in our place. And the reference to the Dying for us is to be an encouragement for us to live as we ought to live. Now, the second question is, how may we die to sin? The only way we can die to sin is to identify ourselves with the one who paid my penalty. Now, I have to identify with him in order to receive the benefits of what he has done for me. Is there something for me to do? Yes, there is. Is that something to do a matter of working out my salvation? 
No, it is not. Why? Because the Bible teaches in Ephesians 2, 8, by grace. Folks, all of this is grace. By grace we are saved through faith. Well, okay. Faith is believing. Faith is trust. Do you really trust somebody if you don't do what they tell you to do? I don't think so. Now, does God expect us to tell the truth? Sure. Is he expected? Uh, is he expecting us to uh, live a pure life? Sure. Is he expecting us to obey the law? Sure. Is he expecting us to help one another? Sure. Now, by the way, in all those things that I've just mentioned, is there anything that we do? Yeah, everything is something we do. It's having the right thought, speaking a kind word, doing a good deed, running an errand, being obedient, setting a right example. All this is a matter of doing. Is that doing, earning salvation? No. He's done what needs to be done. Christ is the one that's done it. It's a gift. Now, what is true about a gift in order for it to be important to you? you have, to have to accept it. Exactly. Now, is there any work involved in accepting a gift? <laughs> yeah. You ever been at a Christmas party with your family? Yeah. Hey, here's your gift. You just look at it and say, okay, thanks. And they just keep looking at you. What's the matter? Don't you like it? Well, I don't know what it is. It just looks like a big box wrapped up in pretty paper. What's well, your gift? And you just keep looking at it. And they think, wait a minute. This doesn't make much sense. Neither does it make much sense for a lot of people to just listen to the gospel preach and do nothing about it. The thing that happens, man, let me tear that wrapping paper off. Let me open it up and see what it is. Thank you. Now I know what it is. And I'm going to use it. And then I really appreciate it. So when we receive the gift of salvation, we let it become very personal to us. And we let the Holy Spirit come into our lives. And we have that wonderful feeling and that wonderful knowledge that uh, the burden of sin has been lifted, that we are free in Christ, and that our salvation is secure because we are a child of the King. Wow. That's a wonderful gift. Does God expect us to behave like we really are grateful for that gift? Yeah, he does. Is not a gift oftentimes for our benefit? Sure it is. Shouldn't we not be grateful for the person who cares enough for us to give us something that we really need? We should. So it's for the purpose of uh, helping us to realize what a blessing it is to be a child of God. So we, we die to sin when we are baptized into Christ because that is the moment in which Christ is designated, you have received my gift with appreciation, and now the gift is beginning to do its work for you. So, the reason we are so certain of the fact that this takes place in baptism is what you read in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. We identify with Christ in his death and in his burial, in that moment of baptism and when we come up out of the waters of baptism he says we rise to walk in newness of life a new creation in Christ this is the way God works now does God work in mysterious ways and different ways in men? Oh, always has <clears throat> does even today we need to understand that so in Romans chapter 6 and verse 11 Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. He's saying basically, Paul is saying basically the same thing that uh, Peter is saying in this particular verse. Now, number three, how may we live to righteousness? Once sin is taken out of the way, then the door is open for us to be the kind of people God intended us to be before Adam and Eve ever sinned to begin with. That is righteousness. Now, did I copy this verse down? Uh, let me see if I did. Yes, I did. Write down, if you don't have this, as an answer to number three, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. He says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
Now listen to verse 10. For with the heart a person believes. Now when he says when a, with the heart a person believes, your belief is demonstrated by your repentance. Do you really believe if you're still hanging on to sin? No, you don't. Do you really trust him if you're still hanging on to sin? No, you don't. So it's kind of like a coin. A coin has two sides. Do both sides look the same? Call them heads or tails, don't mm -hmm. we? Repentance is the other side of faith. If I believe, I'm repent. If I repent, it's because I believe. Now, I'll continue on that analogy. Resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth, he confesses. Now, confession is always in relationship to what? Baptism. That's what identifies a person as a candidate for baptism. So we reveal, because I can't see the heart of an individual. Have I ever baptized somebody that maybe I didn't baptize? I'm just afraid that I might have. There are two times in my life that I'll just have to wait till I get to heaven to find out whether I'm baptized or not. But I have serious questions. One is a person that I really believe my own heart was too young to have an adequate understanding. Didn't want to be the judge. I asked the mother, and the mother was sure that the, this person had good understanding. And uh, just the way the confession was made, I, I just had the feeling that that child was being coached. And I just, I, I'm just concerned. I just don't know. The other one was a man that I never saw before, never have seen since the day I baptized him. Total stranger to me. And uh, I tried to be very frank in explaining what I, what the Bible teaches, what I needed to know about his relationship with God and the genuineness of his confession. But the very fact that I never saw him again just made me wonder, was he really baptized? Now, I don't lose sleep over this. It just, it bothers me, but I don't lose sleep over it. Because ultimately, how can I know? God knows he sees the heart. And uh, I just wonder how many times people have uh, been baptized because of pressure from family, friends, everybody else is doing it, I'm going to do it too. I remember when I was a teenager in, in a Bible camp, and there was a plea for teenagers to commit their lives to full-time Christian service. And uh, I didn't do it. By the, time I, by the time I was in the first grade, I knew I wanted to be a preacher. At least I thought I knew it. And I just never wavered. And I thought, why am I going to do this now? When a student in Bible college, during my years of teaching in Bible college, would come to me and say, uh, what do you think about ordination? I said, well, it's a matter of opinion. And I said, uh, I, I, I don't see anything wrong with it. And a lot of people are ordained into the ministry. But I said, my personal counsel to you is, do not be ordained until you have finished your four years of Bible college training. My reason for that is, I want them to be a student of the Word of God long enough to know that when they say, I want to be set aside as a preacher, they really mean it. It's not just a passing fancy. Is it not true in all churches that there are a lot of people that early in their Christian experience are really active and then months or a few years later, you don't even see them? Mm -hmm. Never darken the doors of the church? <clears throat> that concerns me. And that's why I think we need to take seriously any commitment, any promise we make. So the confession uh, is made valid uh, by our baptism, and our baptism is made valid by our confession. So that's where our salvation begins. But the thing I wanted to point out is in this conversion experience, our faith and our repentance, our baptism, our confession, all mark that moment that we have taken care of the sin problem and now we begin a life of righteous living. Now, should we have a pretty good idea of what righteous living is? Yeah, that's what all the Old Testament's about. 
What does the Old Testament law say? Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. Honor your father and mother. Don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Have no other gods before me. Don't make any idols. Is that still true? Sure is. The only thing that didn't, that has changed, is the day. And the manner in which God's people are identified. We're no longer identified by circumcision, but by baptism. Let me get uh, a bit technical here. I don't want to embarrass anybody about what I'm about to say. But uh, is there anyone in this room right now that can verify the fact that I was baptized? No. Only if you say so. Does that verify it? No, it doesn't. Mm -mm. I asked the Old Testament professor at college where I was <laughs> teaching. One time I said, uh, how would people know who's circumcised? He said, well, they'd have to tell them. And he said, how do I know you've been baptized? I said, because I said so. <laughs> now, the thing that concerns me about that is because our identity sometimes can be hypocritical, can it? We can pretend to be what we're not. I was filling the pulpit for a church where they're looking for a preacher, and uh, a mother and daughter came forward to become a member of the congregation. And so as a visiting preacher, they didn't have any elders. And they said to me, uh, you, you handle this. So I said, well, and I talked to them privately. I, in front of the whole congregation, I just said, in kind of a whisper to them, I said, uh, have both of you been? Yeah. I thought I'd need to check further. I said, have both of you been immersed? Yes. I said, okay. And so having heard them tell me that, I said to the congregation, as I shook hands with both of them, I said, on behalf of this congregation, as two sisters in Christ, we are welcoming you as a part of this body of believers. Well, I was going to be back there the following Sunday. When I got back the following Sunday, the mother had been a little bit bothered because she knew her daughter had only been sprinkled. And uh, so I said to her, I said, well, if that's the case, I'm sorry. But I said, what I did had no meaning at all as far as she's concerned. Because she is not considered a part of the body of Christ if she's not obeyed the Lord. And I said, I hope that she would understand this. And she said, oh, I, she does now. I said, she wants to be baptized. Will you baptize her? I said, yes, I will. And so I did. And I explained to her what had to be the knowledge that I thought that she needed to have to understand why she was being baptized, but she was baptized. <clears throat> All of this, I hope, is making sense to us, but, you know, the thing that makes it so important is exactly what he's talking about here, that we may live under righteousness. This, this marks that point in our lives that uh, it has a definite direction, and the direction's in the right direction. And uh, we identify ourselves on the right road by the way we live, by our response in following our leader, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, when we are baptized into Christ, there are two things that happen. Number one, we receive the forgiveness of all of our sins. Wow, a burden is lifted. Uh, that's not just hoping so, just thinking so, just believing so, it's knowing so. But the second thing is, we receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And I'm afraid that sometimes we've not explained that adequately, but the indwelling of the Holy Spirit simply means that God puts His Spirit in our lives through His Word. You never separate the Holy Spirit from the Word of God. To reject the Word of God is to reject the Holy Spirit. Now, they're not the same. 
supposing that you're going to build a house and you want to make it out of stone or brick and so you get a brick mason or a stone mason to be involved in building that I just drew a blank what am I where am I going with this illustration oh no this is the thing I'm doing <laughs> This is an embarrassing now. No, it's not. The, the thing that I really want to make sure, supposing that the bricklayer shows up, but he doesn't have a trowel. Have you ever seen a brick mason lay brick just with his bare hands? No. No. He's got to have certain tools to use, doesn't he? Have you ever seen a carpenter show up with just a hammer but no nails? You know, he has to have a hammer and nails. Do you get the point that I'm trying to make here? There are some things that go together. Do not separate the Holy Spirit from his sword. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. A sword is an instrument used in warfare. Are we fighting a spiritual battle? Yes. How are we going to win that battle? With a sword. What's the sword? The Word of God. Who empowers us to use that Word of God? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's the one that makes the Word meaningful to us, whereas it's not meaningful to a person who's not a Christian. So the Holy Spirit supplies the power as well as the tool whereby we can become victors in the battle against sin. And so we're promised the gift of the Holy Spirit to be with us to the very end so that we're always uh, fighting on the winning team. So uh, righteousness is uh, the battle we're fighting for truth. Now in verse 25, you thought I'd never get there. <laughs> for you were continually straying like sheep, but now... You've returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Now, how does Peter describe the general condition of humanity? Wandering around like sheep. Straying around like sheep. You're exactly right. How does Peter describe the present status of faithful Christians? We're back home again, too. Now, I want to go over this, too. Uh, I'm not sure I agree with some of the commentaries that I've read. They may be right, and I'll tell you what they say, then you hear what I say. I've got the advantage over them, because I'm going to give you the last word. <laughs> Take that with a grain of salt. I'm just going to challenge your thinking. Uh, this one writer says, it is doubtful that the verb return in this verse implies that Peter's readers had in an earlier time been part of the great shepherd's flock. Now, do you see the reasoning behind that statement? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I'm going to disagree with that. I may be wrong. So you correct me if I am wrong. I think that the word return means exactly what we understand it to mean. And I think they were once a part of that flock. I think the departure came when they reached the age of accountability. And they knew the right from wrong, and they didn't choose the right. At the time they became personally responsible for their own sins, they were no longer a part of his flock. But they were little babies growing up and small children. But they strayed away. That's why the age of accountability is something we have to be very careful about uh, I remember one time I preached a sermon which I made reference to my own conversion and I indicated what my age was when I was baptized into Christ. And I realized that my conversion took place at an early time in life, but I grew up in the church. You know, my dad's a preacher, my parents both were Bible college graduates, and you know, we just lived the church and the Christian life together all the time. But anyhow, as a result of saying that in my sermon, uh, one of the ladies in the church came up to me and said, you know, my son picked up on what you said 
and wonders why I have not let him be baptized yet. And I think he's too young. I said, well, how old is he? He said, well, he's 12. I said, well, uh, you're in a better position to know that than I am, but I'd kind of like to talk to him. And she said, well, I wish you would. And so I came to their home and talked with him and asked him a lot of questions. And, and uh, I thought, wow, at that age, this guy has a good understanding. He grew up in the church with his family. She just thought he was too young. The thing that disturbs me is sometimes when parents will say to little children, no, I think that's saying the very wrong thing. I think they should say, well, this makes me so happy. But wouldn't you like to realize, as you look back on this day in your life, that what you did, you fully understood and knew that you were doing it for the right reason? Yeah. I said, okay, then let me ask you some questions that I think you really need to understand. What does repent mean? I don't know. Well, how are you going to repent if you don't know what it means? And I said, now at your age, I need to put this down in language where you can understand it. Supposing you did something that your mother said you ought not to do. If you repented, you'd say to your mother, mother, I'm sorry. But it wouldn't stop there. You're going to try the best you can not to do that again. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it does. And so I used several different illustrations. And I said, confess. You know what that word means? No, I don't know what it means. You know, when I talk to children, I say, do you know what you have to do to become a Christian? They say, yeah, get baptized. I think, uh oh, there's a red flag. Sure, baptism is important. But what makes it important? It's a faith. It's a personal trust. It's a turning away from sin. It's an acknowledgement that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I know what Savior means, but what does Lord mean? And so I want to explain it to them. And when I've had a chance to explain it to them, and I can go back a few days later and talk to them again, and go right down the line and ask them all these questions that we previously talked about, and they can answer, and they can give me illustrations and explain it, I think, yes, you come to an understanding that now qualifies you at your level to be surrendered. Now, last Wednesday night, a lady came up to me afterwards and said, uh, do you think a person who has not really remained as faithful as they ought to should be rebaptized?" I said, it's not possible. She said, it isn't. I said, no. I said, have you ever known an individual that made a miserable failure of their life? Can they be put back in their mother's womb and be born all over again? No, they can't. What can they do? They can change their ways. They can repent. That's why Jesus said, if you confess your sins, I'm faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. But you don't get rebaptized. You can't rebaptize somebody. Baptism is new birth. Only born once, you know, into the kingdom. And uh, so I went on ahead and said some other things that I felt would help this particular individual and the thing that was bothering him. But a lot of times we, I think, misunderstand some of these things. But uh, it's important for us to realize how important all these things are in our relationship with the Lord. So I think that to return to the shepherd and guardian of our souls is, uh, well, how does Peter describe the present status of the Christians? These are the ones who have returned to the shepherd and guardian of their souls. Uh, so I, I personally understand this as not a case of where they strayed away and come back. It's a case of where once they reach the age of accountability, they live for a time in which they were not right with God, and, some, and they knew it many times. And uh, so they're straying away. They need to come back like they were in their innocence uh, during that period of their innocence prior to their reaching the age of accountability. Um, what is meant by shepherd? Uh, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd or the sheep. I think the shepherd here refers to Jesus, uh, the guardian of their souls. The word guardian is the word episcopeo, which you get the English word episcopal. It's the word that gives us our English word elder, guardian. So he is our elder, he is our shepherd, 
He's the one that watches over us, is concerned for us. It's what a good shepherd does, what a good elder does. Now, what is meant by souls? I think the word soul here could be replaced with the word lives. You know, uh, return to the shepherd and guardian of your lives, the way you live, the kind of person you are. It's using one part of our body to describe the whole body. We do that time to time. There is the soul part of us is the real inner part, but we don't, you know, he's not saying, I want the inner part to be right, but I don't care about the outer part. So I really think he's just using his word to talk about you who are alive, a living person. So the souls would be a way of saying, uh, you return to the shepherd guarding of your persons. Well, this part of uh, our study concludes the suffering uh, part. Uh, he'll have more to say about that when he get into the a little further along later on in the third chapter. But now he's going to return back to the part that he began talking about before we talked about Jesus being an example of our suffering. He's going to talk about relationships. And like he's talked about the relationship that we have with the government, the relationship that uh, we have as a slave to a master, now he's going to talk about the husband and wife relationship. He's going to talk about both uh, what applies to the wife and what applies to the husband. So if you are courageous, come back and listen to a man tell wives how to be good wives. <laughs> That's the painful part right there. And if you're not here, I'm going to quit teaching. <laughs> I'm kidding. So we need to pray. I do anyhow. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for moments of Bible study, the presence of others who encourage us, most of all your presence. You've spoken to us when we read your word, and we've been really looking at each word that you've said, and the way you put the words together in an honest effort to try to understand accurately what you're really communicating to us. And one thing that comes very clear today, you really do love us. You've placed us in a wonderful world. And you've given your only son without sin to be made sin for us that we might become joint heirs with your son Jesus for all eternity. Wow. What a concept to try to wrap around to understand. But hopefully we'll grow in that understanding as we continue day by day and week by week and year by year to study, to show ourselves approved workmen that need not to be ashamed right in dividing the word of truth. Bless us with understanding, strengthen our faith, and draw us closer to you through the working of your spirit through your word and through wonderful Christian sisters like have assembled here today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Chapter 3. You're the best. Coming up.